Welcome everyone, I'm Matej Zahoria and I'm going to give you my perspective on what's next for infrastructure for machine learning. And this is actually based on uh, both, you know, my academic work and an industry perspective um, across Stanford University and Databricks. Um, so I've been working um, on a research group uh, on infrastructure for usable machine learning since 2016. Uh, I'm a PI of the Stanford Dawn Lab, so we've done a whole bunch of research on aspects of that. Uh, and I'm also spending time in industry at Databricks, where um, actually I've um, uh, worked a lot on designing the machine learning platform products that Databricks offers to you know, thousands of enterprise customers, including the MLflow open source uh, project. So I get a perspective on what people are really trying to do uh, with machine learning um, across industry. And I think it's a very interesting area where you know, a lot of things have, have been changing in the past few years. So overall, uh, you know, in both places, we've seen that machine learning is it being adopted for more and more critical business applications. It's not just um, you know things in a in a in a consumer um, application like showing you movies on Netflix. It's actually quite a few things that um, have uh, you know very significant impact on uh, you know the the these uh, these enterprise companies. So, for example, insurance companies like Nationwide are starting to price insurance policies based on data and machine learning. And if you think about it, this pricing is basically their whole business this, and they've been doing this for a very long time they have experts there who work on it and they're trying to figure out you know how to bring in machine learning into it and if you get this wrong then the whole company goes out of business because it's no longer profitable if you set the prices wrong um, likewise, many industrial companies are using machine learning now to manage inventory and supply chains. For example, how much of a chemical to produce, where to store it, you know, when do you expect it to be gone from there, and so on. And again, this affects the company's entire cost and revenue structure. And if you get it wrong, you know, you end up with you know like lots of you know physical chemicals stored there that you have to somehow manage and get rid of. It's very expensive. And of course, in banking, machine learning is also used at large scale for use cases like fraud detection. And the interesting thing there is um, it's also uh, really important to do it in a compliant fashion where you can prove that you're using best practices, that you're not discriminating against people, and so on. So again, quite high impact on the business about what this is doing. So at the same time though, machine learning is very different from traditional software. And there are a lot of problems with it that you wouldn't get in traditional software. So let's look at three differences. Uh, first of all, what's the overall goal? So for traditional software, like say an application on your phone, the goal is to meet a functional specification. Basically, you know, if the user presses this button, you show this thing on the screen. If they press that button, you show something else. And this is sort of a Boolean uh, condition. Either you've met the specification or you haven't, you can kind of look at it and check whether you've met it and you know when you're done. In contrast, in machine learning, the goal is to optimize a metric such as prediction accuracy. And this is something that uh, is, you know, is a continuous value. So you can always do better. You can't just say we're done. And that's also going to change over time based on what's happening in the world outside you. So you, you can't just look at it in isolation. A second difference is what affects the quality. So for traditional software, the quality only depends on application code. If you review all the code that went in there, or if you test all of it or whatever, then you know the application is going to, to, to be correct. And in machine learning, the quality fundamentally depends on input data and also on tuning parameters that you have to set based on the incoming data. So it means that um, you know, it's quite a bit harder to ensure the quality because with code, you can review it, you can make sure no one's changed it and so on and you're fine. With data, there's a whole lot more data going into your system than there is code. You can't really have humans review all of it in, in many cases. Uh, and also the data changes over time and you know, bad things can happen as a result. So you need your software engineering process to somehow be able to work and reason about these massive amounts of data and with these kind of fuzzy metrics that come on top where you, it's, it's not just correct or incorrect. And then the final thing is, you know, the life cycle of these applications. So with traditional software, you build it once and it's mostly done. You know, you might have to make a few changes um, uh, on dependencies and stuff like that. But, you know, basically if you stop touching the code, the application keeps working. With machine learning, you have to constantly update it due to changes in the outside world. 
So really with machine learning, it's not kind of a waterfall model where you just build the application once, you end up actually with a production machine learning life cycle where you have data and it's always passing through this cycle. You do data engineering on it, you do machine learning modeling um, and, and tuning of those models, and then you deploy it and then you get back more data about what's happening with your model. Um, so what we, you know, what I found um, looking across industry and, and across academia in the past five years is that today we have really good tools for training and running models. You know, people don't really have trouble specifying their models, but infrastructure for this production lifecycle is missing. So I think that's going to be the next step in machine learning infrastructure and research is how to support this production lifecycle. It's not how to make it a little bit easier to write DNNs or a little bit faster to run them. Those, those, two, you know, those things are still important, don't get me wrong, but really the biggest impact um, can be had by, um, you know, by making it easier to have this production lifecycle. So what are some of the questions you might have as a result of this, you know, the pretty interesting questions come up in production. For example, how can I find all the data and code that went into the model to show that it's doing the right thing and it's legally compliant or whatever it is, or to help me debug it? How can I automatically retrain and retune the model every day? It's not enough to do at once with an expert sitting there who, you know, tunes all the parameters. You want this, this model to update itself over time. You know, maybe it gets updated every night and you want an automatic process that keeps it uh, working well. And of course, how can I quickly fix the model if there's a problem? If you're now using this to, you know, set prices on your website or decide, you know, when to produce chemicals or stuff like that, you don't have the luxury of waiting a few months to fix the model. You have to have, a, a, you know, as quick as possible of a way to fix it. So I'm going to talk about, um, you know, two, um, two approaches uh, to, um, you know, to, to, to tackle these problems. Um, and the first one is systems uh, to support production machine learning. So this is sort of the obvious one. We'll take machine learning as it is today, but we'll build new tooling around that that makes it easier to run this life cycle. And I'll talk about the concept of ML platforms. That's very important kind of new class of system that's arising in industry and about new abstractions you can use inside these platforms to manage um, you know, machine learning. But then the other thing I want to talk about is some really exciting research on redesigning machine learning methods so that they're more production friendly. So it's easier to fix mistakes, to update it over time and to debug them and so on. And I want to talk about some work um, I've been involved in on retrieval based um, natural language processing, which is you know, proving to be a very exciting alternative to these really large opaque language models like GPD-3, where you can basically outperform these models on many tasks and make the system a lot friendlier for production. Okay, so let me start with the first one. So one of the biggest uh, trends that's happened in the industry over the past five years is this rise of machine learning platforms. So this is software to manage the ML development and deployment process all the way from data to experimentation to production. These are basically APIs and systems that you have to use to build an ML application at many companies today. So some of the well-known examples are the ones inside large tech companies like Google TFX and Facebook FB Learner. But what we found is that virtually every company using ML in a serious fashion is building one of these platforms internally. And so these are platforms that, um, you know, basically give the developer some standard APIs for a lot of aspects of this life cycle and try to automate some of them. So they can do a wide range of things. There isn't really a, you know, a, a standard definition yet, but this can be things like data management, experiment management, you know, model management to let you just look at all the um, objects you produced uh, during, uh, you know, your ML dev process. Um, and also things like deploying the model, making sure it's reproducible, testing and monitoring. And crucially, they're designed to give you a consistent interface when you develop these models so you can do these things. So this is one of the things I've worked on at Databricks and I'll tell you a little bit about our perspective and experience uh, with this in the MLflow open source project. 
So we started working on this in 2018. And back then, this concept was very established of ML platforms. But each company was basically designing its own platform internally for the tools that it used internally. Um, so for example, in Google, you had TFX, which is designed to uh, provide, you know, to, to support TensorFlow applications, uh, but it's limited to TensorFlow. And in many organizations, their platform was also limited to the specific deployment environment they have, like say Kubernetes or something like that. So this, the abstraction of an ML platform was successful, but we found that you know, building your own platform was, was pretty hard. And the, the platform team often became a bottleneck in each organization where you keep bugging them to add support of, for new things. Like for example, you know, if I'm at Google, but I wanna use PyTorch instead of TensorFlow, because there's a really great uh, you know, algorithm someone built in it that I just wanna run, uh, you know, I can't do that unless I convince the team to support PyTorch, which is a lot of work for them. So we took a slightly different approach um, with MLflow, which is we asked, can, can we provide these benefits, but with an open platform that's easy to extend and can in fact be extended you know, by an open source community. So you don't have to have one company building all this. And so that's what we designed in MLflow. It's an open source ML platform, but it's also based on this open interface design philosophy where we make it easy to connect arbitrary machine learning code and tools into the platform. So it's not tied to a specific programming language or ML library or deployment system or anything like that. And you know, from a design perspective, what it meant is we had to design everything around APIs that can work in any environment. So we chose to, to use these REST APIs and command line APIs that you can use everywhere and base a lot of things on containers and just kind of ways of packaging code that aren't tied to a, you know, a, a specific um, uh, system design. So MLflow uh, provides you know, a range of components to do this. Uh, I'll talk about a few of them to give you a sense of what this kind of platform can do. But these range from tracking uh, you know, metrics and experiments to packaging your code for reproducible execution as projects, uh, packaging models, and also sharing and collaborating and you know, uh, managing models in your organization. And then there are built-in connectors with a whole bunch of popular uh, ML libraries and services. And you can also just use the low-level APIs directly to hook in your own application. So for example, a lot of people use it with proprietary internal libraries where you know, we can't add support in the open source uh, project because we don't have access to them, but you know, they can still use it. Um, and it's really uh, become a large community over the past three years. So we're now up to about 8 million downloads per month uh, for the Python client for it, um, 315 contributors to the open source project. And on Databricks, we see over 2 million experiment runs per week. So what does this uh, platform do? You know, how, how does it help? I'll just talk about two of the components. So the, the basic idea is everything you do with your machine learning library can now be packaged and monitored in an automated way. So for example, one of the most popular components is MLflow tracking, which gets you visibility into experiments while you're designing a model and production runs after they run. And the idea here is you have, you know, an ML application, a training application that's got some arbitrary code in there, you know, maybe it's loading and transforming data, maybe it's fitting models using a library like Keras, you know, computing scores and so on. And you can instrument this application with logging. And in many cases, there's actually a, a connector for open source libraries. You, you can just turn on automatic logging and um, MLflow will capture all of the, you know, the metrics and parameters that are exposed in Keras. Uh, if you want, you can also add custom logging statements for custom stuff you want to track. And once you do that, um, MLflow records the results of you know, every time you're on your program uh, for training, uh, you know, either for experimentation or production. And it gives you this user interface over it where you can explore it. And it also gives you a data model that you can query using an API. So using this user interface, you can easily see over time you know, who trained this model, where did it run, what version of um, you know, the Git repository were they in, um, and also exactly what inputs went in and what kind of metrics went out of it. Um, and you can then write automated system that monitor this and see you know, these metrics are going down over time um, and information like that. So very simple concept, but it's one of the, you know, the first things people use because it solves, it, it really improves your um, life even as a, you know, as a, a ML engineer that's just developing a new model. 
And then a second component I want to show is the model registry, which is giving you, uh, you know, a principled way to, uh, to, to think about, hey, what models are available in my organization? How can I deploy them? And how can I test them? And the idea is, is pretty simple, is this sort of GitHub-like environment for managing and reviewing models. So you have model developers that publish models into this registry. Um, then you can have automated tools or human reviewers that you know, listen to it using the API and test the models and, and check for various things. And then you can have downstream users that can query for the latest version of a given model and use it, you know, for, for their application. So as a, you know, basically as a user of this, you can set up models and inside each model, you can register different versions of it. You can just upload new versions and you'll see each version has a stage where we keep track of, you know, what kind of testing it's gone through. So for example, one version is in production and then people have published new versions that need to be tested in order to go out. And, um, when you know when you look at a specific version you can comment on it you can you can use the api to run an automated tool on it and you know leave comments or set tags on it and you can also ask for someone to review it so for example i can say you know this is ready to transition into production i want someone to review it so you have this this reviewing process you have this history of all the versions and then for your production application it's easy to make an application always pull the latest version of a model or to revert back to a specific version if you discover a problem so it's this sort of database uh, with with models in it really makes it easier to manage what's running in production so this is kind of a quick tour of the kinds of things that, that MLflow does. And we see that organizations end up you know, adopting this and then using it at a large scale to automate a lot of the ML process. In many cases, for example, like you, you know, your model has to go through the model registry and only an automated system can deploy it once you have all the improvements. So users never have to worry about what to deploy. So just as an example, you know, uh, T-Mobile um, has been using this to track over 200 different metrics in some of their models. And, you know, they add new metrics all the time and they can see how they're doing over time. Um, and uh, companies like ExxonMobil are actually using this to automate the whole training and deployment process in, in basically a hands-free fashion. So in ExxonMobil, they have thousands of different models that are each, you know, predicting the behavior of like, say, one component in, uh, you know, in one of their chemical plants uh, based on all the sensor data you have from there. And, you know, you can't have a user like look and hand tune all of these. So they basically update them all using an auto ML system. And then they use the APIs in MLflow to just monitor them um, at a high level, like figure out, you know, what are the 10 worst performing models or like, you know, what models regressed since last week or stuff like that. So it's really working with machine learning at this level above the tuning of an individual model. Um, and then this, this approach of like managing, you know, large amounts of models through the API is also really nice if you're worried about privacy and compliance. So for example, QB is a, is a company in Europe that, um, you know, helps energy providers uh, tell each household how they can improve their energy usage, you know, anything you can do to save power. And, you know, they do all this through, uh, uh, you know, an automated process based on ML flow. So it means that the data scientists don't usually have to look at any particular household's data. Instead, they can just train these models and see overall statistically how are, how are the models doing across, you know, many households. So it basically moves machine learning from this thing where you're really focused on like, how do I specify the model with the libraries you have today, like TensorFlow and PyTorch to how do I actually manage lots of these things that are, you know, affecting a you know, real world process. Okay. So that's kind of the idea of ML platforms. I also want to point out that there's a lot of room for new abstractions that can be used inside these platforms. You don't have to, you know, just focus on what the production engineers do. And there are quite a few interesting ideas coming up there. So for example, data is a huge part of machine learning. So there've been these, you know, recently pro uh, proposed abstractions like TFX's data validation library or slicers from the Snorkel project at Stanford that, um, you know, give ML developers different ways to think about their input data and to try to fix problems in it or monitor issues with it in advance. And another example I wanted to give that uh, my group has been developing is model assertions, which is a way to test ML software that can also feed into the training and basically give you models that avoid certain uh, failure modes. 
So just to give you, you know, a little bit of detail on how this works, what we found, you know, when we talk to um, users who have to deploy these, these applications and improve them is the applications often fail in complex, hard to debug ways, but there's often a succinct description of what is going on. So you can actually, you know, you can tell me in a sentence the, the kind of thing that's happening and you can even write, uh, you know, code that actually checks for that kind of problem to some, some degree of accuracy. So an example is, you know, with Tesla, they had this issue for a while where the cars would speed towards lane dividers in the middle of a highway and they would crash into it. So it's really hard to, to say why this might be happening. You know, is it some bad record in the training data? Is it something about the DNN architecture where, you know, it doesn't recognize those patterns? Who knows what it is, but it's actually easy to describe the behavior and even to test for it using software because you just say, hey, I have a car, you know, I know it's position and I see that it's speeding, you know, it's like targeting dead ahead for a lane divider. So I can easily de detect when this problem is happening. Um, another example, you know, happened in a lot of domains is worse predictions of your ML model based on the person's race. You know, if they have dark skin, for example, you can't, uh, you know, you can't um, classify like skin disease as well or something like that. Again, you know, there are many reasons why it could be happening different ways you could try to fix it, but it is relatively easy to test for it, at least if you if you know the race of like, you know, someone you're making a prediction for, you can easily check when this problem is happening. So the question we, we sought to answer here is how can we test and improve the quality of ML applications when you know that at least some failure modes can be described this way? And the idea was to use um, assertions, a standard concept in software engineering, but actually figure out how to make them useful uh, for the machine learning uh, you know, production life cycle. Um, so assertions are just arbitrary predicates you, you have on, usually on state in your software. In our case, we're going to just have predicates on input and output of an ML application. And they're just basically any code, like in our system, it's literally a Python function you write that can look at the inputs and outputs and say, you know, this looks okay, or I think something is wrong. So for example, one problem we found working uh, with uh, video uh, processing models is you'd have models that detect objects in some frames of the videos, but not in others. And in adjacent frames, it's super likely that you have the same object. So, but you would have this kind of flickering behavior where sometimes you detect it, sometimes you don't. So it's really easy to write a Python program that kind of checks for this behavior. You just assert that across you know, a window of frames objects didn't flicker in and out between subsequent frames. And then what we do in, in our research with this is we, we can use these assertions in two ways. So we can use them just to monitor, that's really easy. We just run it and tell you, you know, what percent it's failing. So that's just a metric you would look at in your system. But we've also used, that, used them to improve the training process. In particular, using these assertions that people write in code, we designed an active learning method that helps you hunt for new data at the label that will train your model to avoid this failure mode. And we also designed a weak supervision method where uh, basically we can correct the label for you and we can guess what the label should be for the frames where the model got it wrong, just based on the code you wrote to, you know, to tell us uh, that something is going wrong. And both of these actually lead to very easy ways to improve quality of your model in many domains. So here are some example assertions in the different domains we've worked on. Um, for in video analytics, I talked about this flickering one where objects flicker in and out across frames. Um, so that's something we could easily express. For autonomous vehicles, we looked at uh, vehicles that have both LiDAR and video cameras, and we can have an assertion that these two things agree on what objects they find. And it turns out we can use this to improve the models for both LiDAR and video. Um, and we also looked at hard rhythm classification uh, using ECGs. And basically they also had this kind of flickering or consistency behavior where you know, the classifier would suddenly say you have a disease for a few seconds and then you don't. So you can assert that you know, output class should not change very frequently. And uh, we were able to use these both to improve the supervision process by um, you know, selecting unlabeled data that will train a model to avoid these and also to automatically suggest corrections to, um, you know, to, to the model's output on unlabeled data and basically use that for weak supervision to train a better model. 
So just as an example that we, we have in our paper, uh, this was a video analytics model. We, we just got you know, an object detector um, online, uh, the SSD one, and we applied it to this video stream. And we used only weak supervision using assertions to significantly improve its quality. So if you look on the left, the model is, you know, is sometimes detecting every car. It's often kind of missing them or detecting multiple boxes. If you look on the right, it always, um, you know, it, it always um, uh, basically uh, detects um, every car as it's moving through this intersection. And this is done using, you know, no additional human labeling, just running it on a bunch of video, um, taking the output of the assertions and then using that to, you know, to train an updated model that then does better on a test set. Um, so we have two papers on this, including at uh, this year's VLDB, we have a joint paper with Toyota Research on using it for data and, you know, real autonomous vehicle pipeline. Okay, so that's been systems to, to support production machine learning. There's quite a bit to be done. I think it's a very exciting area, uh, but there's also, you know, a whole different angle you can do, which is what if we made our ML methods actually more productionizable? And I wanna talk about this one thing I've been working on uh, uh, with collaborators at Stanford on retrieval based NLP. So everyone's aware, I think of large scale NLP models today. These are these huge, um, you know, language models with hundreds of billions of parameters that are getting very impressive results, but they're also black boxes. So for example, with something like GPT-3, you can train it on lots of data from the web and then ask it a question and it might, it'll give you an answer that's, you know, oftentimes it actually is the correct answer to that question. So that's really cool. Um, but these models have a whole bunch of problems if you actually try to use them in, you know, real production applications. Um, first of all, they're just very expensive to train and run inference on because you've got these, you know, trillions of parameters in there. And each time you do an inference, you have to do math operations, you know, computing with all these trillions of parameters that encode the model's knowledge to, you know, to, to give you this answer. So that's, you know, that's a practical problem. Uh, second, they, it's very hard to interpret what they do and they can hallucinate answers that are totally wrong. And, you know, you can't, you can't easily prevent that from happening. And then the third problem is, as I mentioned, in production applications, you often need to update the model. So, for example, let's imagine your model called the web page with incorrect information, and now it's answering questions based on that. You don't want to wait three months to retrain GPT-3 just to correct the answer to that question. It's very impractical. Or let's say you ask the model something like, who's president of the United States, and you don't know until after election night. You know, you can't leave your model to wait for three months before it answers that question correctly. You want it to answer it right away. So how do we tackle this? So our approach um, is this, this is led by my student Omar Katab, and it's a collaboration with Chris Potts, um, is this retrieval oriented approach to do NLP, where instead of trying to encode all the knowledge in a model's weights, and then just use them every time we do a prediction, we actually try to, to have a model that lives alongside a collection of documents, text documents, basically that represents um, knowledge about the world. Um, and basically every time the model does a prediction, it learns to look up the most relevant do uh, documents in the collection for the prediction it's trying to make uh, using a retrieval model and then read them and then produce an answer. And the answer can even have a reference back to, you know, which of the, um, of the, of the items uh, in the text collection it used. So really the insight is let's factor out our machine learning model. Let's separate out the language processing part that's parsing questions from the knowledge about the world as much as possible. So that like which items actually, you know, help you uh, treat your digestive system or something like that. Um, and the, the result is also that these, these retriever and reader models can actually be much smaller than something like GPT-3 and can still give you, you know, the same or you, oftentimes even better accuracy on uh, these types of uh, tasks. So what are the benefits? So first of all, much faster inference, you know, instead of having to, um, to run through trillions of parameters that encode all your knowledge, basically almost like a linear scan through all your knowledge with something like GPT-3, with these models, you can uh, just retrieve a few of them and then work on them with, you know, much smaller DNNs. So it's a little bit like a hash table lookup as opposed to a linear scan. 
Um, the second thing is they're easy to interpret. You see where the predictions came from. You know, again, not not completely, you know, trivial to interpret, but a lot easier than GPD-3. And then finally, the really cool thing is you can update the knowledge in milliseconds just by updating a document. You know, if this medical uh, text about what uh, protects the digestive system changes, you just change that one document and the model will be answering with the correct thing right away. So much, much better if you're trying to use this in production. So how do these things do? So we actually found that with these, you were able to get state-of-the-art results on many tasks at a much lower compute cost as well than these very large models like, um, you know, like GPD-3. And we've used this for three tasks so far. So information retrieval, this is just search. We were able to match these very expensive BERT-based retrievers at orders of magnitude lower cost with our uh, model called Colbert. Um, for question answering, we have a paper out this year that improves the state of the art scores on trivia QA and natural questions by three to 12 points. Uh, and is, again, it's very fast to compute with. And for multi-hop reasoning, uh, where you have to basically reason across information in multiple documents, we have a system called Baleen that improves the, the score on you know, one of the hardest benchmarks in this field hover from 15 to 57 points. So it's really you know, much better than anything out there. And we're also working to apply this in other tasks. So I'll just give you a little bit of info on how these works. You, you can look at some of our papers for more details. There were basically two um, key research ideas that led to these results. One is improvements in IR. We designed a way to do retrieval uh, called late interaction that preserves a lot of the modeling benefits of transformers where different terms in the query and document can interact and can give each other context, but enables efficient retrieval using you know, things like hash tables or inverted indexes. So that's one insight that's powering all these results. And then the second one is supervision methods for this retrieval oriented paradigm. You basically have to teach your model how to search for relevant documents given only the final answer for the task, like the answer to your question. You know, how do you teach the model to, for example, search Wikipedia to answer the question I showed? So I'll give you just a little bit of um, intuition about uh, both these two things. So first let's talk about retrieval. How do you search you know, a collection of documents um, using some kind of neural network? So before our work, there were basically two common ways of doing it. The first one, representation similarity is probably the, the most obvious thing you could do. You take your queries and documents and you just embed them using a language model like BERT and you basically get these embeddings for each of them. And now to do retrieval, uh, to do a search, you just need to do nearest neighbor search on these vectors. So you take your query, you embed it, and then you find documents whose vectors look similar and you pull those out. And this is nice from a systems perspective because um, it's very efficient. You just encode each document once and then you do this very cheap index lookup for nearest neighbor search. But it's not great from modeling perspective because you have to condense each document to this one representation for it. And you know, really each document might contain many different types of information. So it's, it's pretty limiting. So the accuracy with it isn't usually that great. And then the second approach that's actually used, for example, in search engines like Google today is called um, uh, re-ranking. So basically you take, um, you, you, you take your query, you pull out, you know, maybe the top a thousand or 10,000 documents using a model like the one on the left. So whatever your favorite cheap model is, but then for each of them, you run BERT over both the query and the document. Um, and you basically can train BERT to rank documents based on the full knowledge of the query terms and the document terms. So this gives you this information about context of all the terms. You can tell each word in the query, you know, how it relates to different parts of the document. And it gives you excellent high quality results, but inference becomes expensive. You basically have to run thousands of documents through this kind of language model that looks at all to all interactions. Um, so it's, it's it, you know, it's very costly to do this. So how does Colbert work? So the idea is, um, it's called late interaction. And basically it's to do something a little bit in between. So we'll take the query and document and we'll run all but the last layers of BERT independently on each of them. So we can basically pre-compute these. So this gives you all the interactions between query terms and other query terms or document terms and other ones. So you can learn about context there and figure out what these terms mean in that context. 
And then for the last layer, we'll take an approach similar to the full um, you know, re-ranking approach on the previous slide, where basically we compute a max similarity score. For each word in the query, we compute a, a similarity between its embedding and every embedding in, in, in the document for every token. And then we sum these up and that gives us our score for the query and document. Um, so it turns out actually that doing this interaction between query and document only at the latest level is actually enough to essentially match, like very closely match the performance of those full ranking models. And you get the, the computational efficiency because this max sim search that I'm showing here can actually be done using an index. You, you don't have to scan over the whole collection to compute it. There are ways to do pruning that let you do it uh, very cheaply using an index. So you get sort of the benefits of all the previous approaches. You get scalability, efficiency, and the modeling uh, properties of a full, you know, all-to-all -all, uh, interaction in, in your language model. So these are the, the results with it on information retrieval. Um, basically, you can see, so this is showing query latency and uh, the MRR score for retrieval. And you can see with Colbert, um, you can get um, almost the same uh, MRR score as these bird-based approaches that, that are uh, you know, at the top right, but you can run uh, you know, two or three orders of magnitude faster. And actually these are results from our Colbert paper. We've actually improved the speed of Colbert um, even more since then. So now it's actually very close to the, uh, the, the, the cheat methods um, on the left of the graph. So really, you know, simple approach, but that a modeling approach that gives you a lot of the benefits of the full interaction in a language model. Okay, so that's like one, one thing we're doing. And then the other thing I talked about is supervision. Um, so, you know, for other tasks and retrieval, um, often the answer of your task, you know, um, doesn't tell you which documents you have to look at to, 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 to answer it. So for example, for question answering, um, you have a you know, question like, well, where is the world's largest ice sheet? You have uh, an answer like Antarctica, but how do you know which pages on the internet or in Wikipedia or whatever you have to look at in order to you know, train a model that can actually answer the question? It's not really easy to do. Um, so usually in these systems, you have um, these two models I showed before, a retriever that decides what to look at in the corpus, and then a reader that looks at the top K passages and answers the question. And the question is how to supervise these. And in our paper on Colbert QA, we basically developed an iterative supervision method where you can start with a retriever that is not trained to answer questions at all. For example, it just takes that question and basically treats it as a search query and looks for documents that match all those, um, you know, all those terms. And then you can use the answer to the question to figure out, hey, which documents seem like they would help to answer it? Like, do they even contain the token Antarctica? And if they do, then you, you say, okay, these are better to retrieve. And it turns out that by training a sequence of retrievers iteratively this way, using the answer to the question basically as weak supervision, you can end up with a, a very good retriever that actually learns how to search to answer questions, not just to find documents that match a lot of the terms. So that's the idea in Colbert QA. Um, and uh, this is the one that I mentioned, you know, gets significantly better results on the natural questions and trivia QA data sets compared to, uh, you know, previous approaches uh, for these, uh, tasks. And then the final thing I'll just briefly describe is multi-hop reasoning. So multi-hop reasoning um, is, is this task where, you know, you're, you're trying to verify a statement. Like someone writes down a statement, you're supposed to say whether it's true or false. But to figure that out, you have to look up information across many documents in a, in a corpus. So in general, like knowledge you, you might have used during training. Um, so in this case, you know, th this is a, a question from the hover data set, which runs over Wikipedia. And to verify this task, you have to look at three different Wikipedia articles to figure out that this person actually, um, you know, uh, umpired a game or like the MVP went to the Baseball Hall of Fame. So it's a pretty difficult task. And, you know, when you're building a model for this in the retrieval oriented way, if you haven't just memorized all the documents, it's pretty hard to tell which documents you're supposed to extract. 
So we designed the system Berlin that has, again, a, an iterative supervision approach and that basically learns how to do multi-hop retrieval, where you, you retrieve one set of documents, you read them, and then based on that, you send essentially new queries into the corpus and you retrieve more of them until you find you know, enough to answer uh, the original question or to verify the original fact. Um, so we have a paper on this on archive. Um, I don't have you know, time to explain all of it, but this is the thing that uh, basically set this you know, very high new state-of-the-art score on hover uh, because you know, it gave a principled way to think about multi-hop reasoning and to supervise it using this week's supervision that actually trains models that can solve this kind of complicated question. So this is a quick tour of retrieval-oriented uh, NLP. There are a lot of really interesting uh, things you can do with it that we're working on. Uh, for example, one of the cool things, since you can add and remove individual documents into your model so quickly, is you can also start to do kind of logical reasoning about how you answer your queries. For example, you might ask a question and say, give me an answer to this question that both Fox and CNN agree on. And you just run it on the Fox corpus once and on the CNN once, and then you see, hey, what, you know, do, do they agree? Because it's very easy to swap documents in and out of the corpus. Uh, this is something would be very hard to do with GPD-3 unless you train multiple ones of them. Um, another cool thing is you can actually just query data from operational systems as your documents. So for example, you know, let's say your model is answering questions about the inventory in the store. When it retrieves a given document, you can actually update it by querying that inventory and getting you know, the very latest version of uh, you know, how many items are in stock. Because again, it's so cheap to update it in just milliseconds to pull in another document. And we're also working on extending this to other NLP tasks like classification and text generation. So we have a blog post on this. I definitely encourage you to read more. So yeah, that was my talk. So I do think the biggest problems for ML users today are around the production life cycle. And there are quite a few interesting research opportunities in systems and a lot of people are working on them, but it's also possible to change machine learning itself to be more productionizable. And uh, you know, I'm really excited about uh, some of the results we're getting here with NLP. And you know, we're working to extend this to a wide range of tasks uh, uh, and to see how far this approach can take us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Matei, for this uh, wonderful talk and packed with uh, information, knowledge, and uh, in-depth uh, uh, insights as well. So um, I've been looking at whether we have questions. If there is any question from the audience, please type them in. And I can start with a couple of questions in mind. So um, uh, on the retrieval-based um, ML models, so beyond the domain of NLP, what other domains might this work well? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, I, I've been excited about a couple of different domains there. One of them is actually reinforcement learning, where I think you could find uh, scenarios from your training that look like the one you're currently facing using retrieval, and then you know decide what to do based on that. Uh, we haven't really tried to do this yet, but I think it has a similar um, uh, you know uh, setup because you have such a long history. Um, and uh, you know the other one would be uh, would be uh, vision, where we'll, we're curious to see whether this works. Mm. Okay, so that uh, there is a question coming from the audience. So is is MF flow something like a Keras before it become part of the TensorFlow? I mean, when it was an interface for multiple ML backend, not only TensorFlow. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just reading it directly. Yeah. So yeah, did you get the spirit of the question? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, MLflow isn't about how you build your model at all. So it's sort of a separate thing you use alongside your modeling library. So it's not meant to be, you know, used with just a single library. It's meant to be used alongside everything. The same way you might use, you know, Git or something like that with anything else you're using. Mm, okay. And uh, there were uh, uh, quite a few interest in uh, your papers. And so uh, if we search on VLDB or archive by your name, we should be able to find them, correct? 
Yeah, all the all the papers I mentioned for the retrieval stuff are on archive, and you know the two that are accepted at conferences are on my website also. Okay, um, great, yeah. great, thank you. So, um, what are the some other next tasks you're working on with the retrieval based model? Yeah, the, there are quite a few things we're we're looking at um, using it for text generation. So, for example, something like dialogue. That's one thing we're working on and we also have a project uh using it for sentiment analysis actually where uh you know again you look up like who who has used similar kinds of wording maybe on similar products or in a similar context and um, and you can analyze uh, sentiment that way so these are two of the things we're, we're doing mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so um I have a question uh, out of my own work experience so with mm -hmm. the domain. I guess it's a going kind of going back to the NLP, where we have uh, extremely sparse knowledge uh, in the buried in the large quantity of uh, documents or web pages where we do not know how important they are. Mm -hmm. So therefore, our end result might be a very tiny uh, collection of knowledges to extract the knowledge. But uh, in the meantime, we need to, uh, we don't know what to look for in the massive amount of uh, web uh, information. Would, uh, would you recommend we look into adopt adopting this uh, retrieval based uh, approach? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So um, you can um, with so so basically, this is a more, you know, this is probably just a better way to do retrieval uh, than a traditional like keyword based search. So it's using something like Colbert anywhere that you do a keyword or BM 25 type of search is probably a good idea. And you can you can actually train it in a pretty sort of self supervised way where you, you can like take you know fragments out of a document and search and make sure you receive you retrieve that same document or you re retrieve like related passages from it. Um, so you know there's some work to figure out like what will make it work well for your corpus but you know as a start even just pre training BERT on your corpus and then using its you know representations could get you farther than like a traditional uh, search index. Mm -hmm. That makes a, a great sense. Would uh, if we pair that up with uh, some domain knowledge that's already mm -hmm. captured with uh, some kind of uh, within some data structure knowledge graph, uh, would yeah. uh, would you see that a good exercise to go about? Yeah, definitely. Well? Yeah, and I think actually searching, like I talked a lot about searching a collection of text passages, but searching a knowledge graph or you know, tabular data or anything like that also makes a lot of sense. And that's actually one of the things that we'd love to do if, uh, you know, we, we want to find some some data sets where we can try that out. But it makes a ton of sense to, to embed those and to search those in the same way as text passages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you. And that might be a very great uh, segue into our next talk. But before we switch over, uh, I know things uh, move uh, and progress very fast uh, since your uh, last conversation preparing the talk. Are there any latest the new excitement you want to share with us before we switch over? Hmm. I don't know. We, we have uh, we're, we're going to have a blog post on all this stuff coming out soon if you want to get more details on it, I guess. And we also have a new release of Colbert that's on GitHub that reduced basically it compressed the index by a factor of eight or so compared to the past one. So if you want to play around with it, it's a lot easier than before. Um, mm -hmm. These are things. Yeah. That's great. So the blog is the, the, the URL you pasted in the slides, the tiny. Yeah, graph. that's a that's a like a somewhat less technical blog. We'll have a new one coming up soon. So I guess if you look at like my website or Twitter or whatever, you'll see a more technical one. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. And I think that's about run, rounding up our, our questions. So thank you again very much for this uh, information knowledge packed the talk and thanks again uh, for the uh, coming to KDD also. Thanks a lot. Yeah, great to present here. Yeah.